My first physics course was a senior in high school and it was taught by a chemistry teacher and uh, he only took us in the lab once and uh, then wired up a diagram with a light bulb in it and we warned him not to turn the switch on because uh, he thought he had it wired in parallel and it was in series. He turned it on and the light bulb blew up and after that it was all just lectures with equations. <laughs> um, so that was, that was a, a fun introduction. Uh, and I realized at that time I needed to learn as much from other students sometimes as from the teachers. Uh, but then I majored in physics in, in college, a, a small four-year Catholic college uh, in the Cincinnati area, uh, now called Thomas More College. Uh, and when I was a sophomore there, uh, majoring in physics, I got to work on an NSF grant and I worked on it sophomore, junior, senior year um, and, and really kind of learned what research was in doing that. So that was a side job, but I did get paid for it and could help pay tuition with that. Um, and uh, eventually wrote a paper on studying crystals with um, magnetic fields and uh, learning what the fields were down inside the crystal. So uh, that, was, that was pretty important to me. And then I went from there to a large university, University of Illinois and majored there in, in physics and um, eventually worked with, uh, I was the first student of Professor Chang there who was himself had been a student of Julian Schwinger who was a Nobel laureate at Harvard. So I'm kind of the academic grandson of Schwinger. And uh, Dr. Chang helped me learn physics all the way up through quantum field theory. And I did my PhD in quantum field theory studying particle physics. And then uh, finished my PhD and continued to do research in particle, elementary particles, so protons, neutrons, electrons. Those come from the sun also in the solar wind. Um, and uh, got interested in astronomy and started teaching astronomy. That's an example where I'd never had an astronomy course, but I was teaching it, so I had to learn it. Uh, and was using a planetarium and an observatory with a 16-inch telescope. Uh, so that was, that was uh, great fun and got me very interested in astronomical observations and thinking of the Earth as a planet, just like any other planet, thinking of the whole Earth and not just the region where I lived. Uh, and then um, after doing that, I went to Boulder, Colorado, where I worked at the Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. Uh, and um, started doing climate research. So that was my first publications in climate. And I looked at um, what we were calling ice caps at that time. So the planets have ice caps at the, near the North and South Pole. And what would happen if the sun changed? If the sun cools off a little bit, the ice cap grows. If it brightens up, the ice cap shrinks a bit. And our ice caps stable when the sun is changing. We knew already then the sun wasn't a constant. And we found that big ice caps and small ice caps are not stable. Ones in between can be stable. Like the, the last ice age, the ice cap was coming down into Wisconsin and New York and so on. Those can be stable and last a very long time. But when you have only a small ice cap, like Greenland, for example, it's not stable, so when it starts to melt, it's likely to keep melting until it's completely gone. So that was a paper in the late 1970s, and I went from uh, Boulder to Goddard at that time, 1979, and I've been here since uh, doing space missions and observations and trying to improve our forecasts of climate. 